And now for a Stansbury exclusive. I'm Jessica Stone at Stansbury Research alongside uh, Scott Garlis of the Stansbury Newswire. We're on the road to recovery covering the IMF World Bank annual meetings. And we have the great fortune to be able to interview Fabio Natalucci, uh, the deputy director for the monetary and capital markets at the International Monetary Fund. And Scott, he's kind of the guy who takes a look at what worked and what didn't in the response from all the central banks. Yeah, and he's got experience because he worked during the financial crisis in the U.S. Uh, so what will be really interesting to hear is his take on, on what he thought has worked really well this time versus what didn't last time. Well, Fabio, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Stansberry. Uh, you know, you were serving in the U.S. government 10 years ago during the last financial crisis. I wonder, uh, first of all, what your observations are then and now in terms of the government response to this pandemic yeah, so I think there's two major differences between now and the financial crisis more than 10 years ago. One is the nature of the shock. So right now it's a pandemic uh, originated in one specific part of the globe and very quickly spread to the rest of the globe. Um, there's not much to do in terms of controlling the spray on the web. It's, it's a healthcare, it's a, it's a health issue, has to do with vaccine, with therapeuticals, but it's a, very, it's a real shock. 10 years ago, 10 more than 10 years ago, it was a financial shock. It was originated at the center of the financial system, hit the banks, the bank delivered, from the banks went to the other corner of the financial system. So first of all, the nature of the shock is different now. So the comparison needs to keep that in mind. Second one is the speed and the scope of the response, right? So if you go back more than 10 years ago, uh, it took a while to cut raise to zero, and then the Fed started experimenting with unconventional monetary policy, asset purchases, um, some of the facilities. Uh, back then, those were at the frontier in some sense of monetary policy. We were trying to do things that haven't been done before. Um, right now, uh, the response was much weaker. Um, so just to give you an idea, in the take the G10 countries, the balance sheet of central banks in the G10 have expanded by about seven and a half trillion. Um, back then, the Fed started doing asset purchases and then other major central banks follow. There was no emerging markets that did uh, asset purchases back then, for example. Now we have like 18 central banks. Um, the arsenal that has been used is very wide, good scope. First of all, for central banks, right? So cut, rates were cut to zero, there was liquidity provided to the banking system, there were asset purchases, and then this long list of credit facilities. And the credit facilities are now there are even more than when I was there. So they expanded into segment of financial sector, sector that back then we didn't go. So no credit markets, for example, or no munis, SMEs. But the other part that it's important is that also it was accompanied now by a fiscal policy response that came out at the same time of the monetary policy. That combination of monetary policy and fiscal policy, I think is crucial now because monetary policy, there's only so much can do in terms of solvency. Monetary policy can help, can provide a bridge in some sense, to, to the future, but to address solvency issue, which is what we are facing now, you need fiscal policy. So the combination of more, not only the speed now and the scale and size, but it's the combination of monetary policy or fiscal policy that has made the response unprecedented and successful at this point. Picking up on what the IMF has been pushing for in terms of a fiscal stimulus, um, there's this message coming out of the IMF that there needs to be greater investment in infrastructure. Um, and that could be digital infrastructure or green infrastructure. There's a whole range of possibilities there. But what does that mean for asset markets? So the, the response in risk asset prices has been very, very strong, right? So we have seen a robust, very, very large rebound in global equities. Um, the response of, the, of course, the, the recovery in risk asset is varied by both countries and, and sectors. So for example, in the US, the S&P now it's up almost 10%, it's down about 12% equity prices in, in, in Europe. They're pretty much flat in Japan, up some in emerging markets, up 10% in China. So differentiation across country. There's also differentiation across region, across sectors, right? So sectors that have been affected by the pandemic most, so more contact intensive, like, I don't know, hotels, airlines, uh, those have been hit much more than sectors like technology, communication, that in some sense have benefited from this. And so our sense is valuation appear to be a little stretched now compared to fundamentals and can be explained in this, 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 uh, this stretch valuation in number, by a number of factors. Uh, one again is the sectoral composition. So sectors that uh, indices that they have a higher percentage of tech, for example, are doing much better. Mm -hmm. We have seen retail participation. There's a lot of chatting in, in markets and press coverage on how retail have jumped into the equity market in the last few months. And that probably provided a boost 
uh, to equity prices. And also, there's a policy support, right? So if you think about equity valuation, what matters is the discount factor you use to discount earnings. So even if earnings are weaker or their expectation of weaker earnings going forward, you get a quick, a lower discount factor, and also you have a compression of the equity risk premium. So part of it, it's intended policy. Uh, it's intended objective of policy, which is to boost investor sentiment, reopen financial markets, get the credit, the credit going. But also, at least when I say discussing about global financial stability risk, is to think about the unintended consequences of policy, right? What are the possible unintended side effects in terms of financial stability? So as long as there is a perception that monetary policy will be there, the fiscal policy will be there, there will be more public investment, that probably will continue to push support equity prices or risky assets more generally, similar argument for credit markets. Uh, the concern, though, is the side effect, this un unexpected uh, a consequence of the policy and also the possibility that market sentiment can can switch right so there could be triggers like the, the recovery is delayed it's not as a v-shape that some investor seems to expect or that the extent and duration of policy support is not what in fact market are pricing now or there could be some geopolitical events like it could be i don't know negotiation in brexit ongoing now uh, could be a result of the U.S. election, could be geopolitical tensions uh, in, in parts of the globe. So there's only possible triggers that could, in some sense, push investors to, to reassess. I, I do think it's interesting, and, and I'm, I'm sure you learned this when you were working in the U.S. side, is that the, the intentions of the Fed, and by expressing those intentions way ahead of time, it's really helped the markets sort of do a lot of the job for the Fed ahead of the Fed actually enacting the policies, you know? Right, so the story, the success story here has been one where to the combination of tools that central banks have employed. So cutting rates to zero, forward guidance, asset purchase, credit and liquidity facility, they managed to reopen credit markets. And that's crucial because it allows firms to have, at least the large firms, to have access to markets. So even firms that came under pressure in the spring allow, allow them to get to either extend credit, refinance credit, take down lines of credit at banks. And so they allow them essentially to postpone, to provide a bridge to the recovery. Now, other sectors have done not as well, for example, SMEs, those have been hit harder. Uh, they don't have the same type of access Small to Small and medium-sized businesses. Yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> they don't have the same kind of access to capital markets that larger firms have. They have a less diversified base of revenues. Mm -hmm. um, they also have less liquidity, thinner cushion, and also they're being more exposed to the pandemic, right? Those are more the intensive, the, uh, in, uh, contact intensive sector, like, I don't know, entertainment, uh, restaurants. Uh, and so those have benefited less. But the, to me, the big positive of the central bank intervention here has been boost investor sentiment, ease financial condition, provide, keep markets open so that at least there is a bridge to the recovery. And then that's where fiscal policy needs to step in and in some sense address the insolvency issues. Yeah, I feel like there's a misperception in the media too that, uh, so we often hear a lot of speculation that central banks are running out of tools to sort of fight some of this downturn. Do you believe that's true? Okay, so perhaps I'm slightly biased here because I come from <laughs> um, I, I don't believe that. Um, I, I think Fed, but also other central bank, the ECB, Bank of Japan, and also emerging markets now, they have proved to be quite creative, right? So it's not just an issue of cutting rates to zero. In fact, in some countries, they went below zero. They went negative. Mm -hmm. Now, it's in the bail out negative, you can go and what's appropriate. But you can cut rates more. If that's not enough, you can provide forward guidance or get a sense of like where rates would be. So if you look at the at the SCP, so the, the Fed predict uh, the Fed uh, release of what uh, committee participants expect the federal funds rate to be over the next year, they have the federal funds rate essentially flat until 2023, right? That's a way of communicating mm -hmm. uh, in some sense. I don't want to call it commitment, but intention of the central bank given what is known today. Uh, they can do asset purchases, and then they also have employed like credit facility again that provided direct support to markets in the hope of bridging to the recovery. So I, I don't, I don't believe the story that they're out of ammunition. That, that said, though, it is still crucial the coordination that we have seen now. At least the the, the help the monetary policy has gotten from fiscal policy has been crucial because it's the combination of the two that provide the biggest support to the economy. It's the one-two punch. Yeah. Yeah. What about emerging markets? What are the risks as people look for growth uh, going to those right now? So emerging markets, as the same example I made before, corporates before, they benefited from the improvement in global financial conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So the, what they've seen, we have seen U.S. rates going down. Lower rates allow central bank in the emerging markets to also cut their own monetary policy without putting pressure on currencies or, or inflation. 
they employ as the purchases themselves, and they benefit more broadly from the boost in risk in, in, in investor sentiment. That can be seen also now emerging markets regain access to global capital markets. We have seen originally was the investment grade, large sovereign, they were able to come back to market, but it's starting to trickle down now also to sub-investment grade issuer, for example. So as of September, about one third of market access now it's, it's high yield, it's sub-investment grade sovereign, even in emerging markets. We have seen some issuance coming back also in the what we call frontier markets. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 25 billion for the year. So we're seeing that essentially it's trickling down. The same way for corporate, it start with investment grade, and it's moving down to a yield and the yield market is booming in the US. The same you see in emerging markets or even where the sub-investment grade corporates are able to access. So of course, that's one piece, right? That's clearly helped because help is financial condition and provide some from space, breathing space. At the same time, it's important that the health situation is taken, it's under control so that this country are able to manage the pandemic. They have the fiscal space to spend the money that is needed to save lives and livelihood. So, that's the external piece essentially, which is the ex external global uh, global risk market sentiment. And then there's also taking care of the domestic fundamentals. And that's where I think you see even now some differentiation between some countries doing better than others. What about the role China has played this time? Obviously, uh, 10, 10, 11 years ago, uh, China's uh, stimulus, uh, public stimulus into its infrastructure really helped pull the global economy uh, out of its uh, out of its malaise. Um, this time, uh, it's also growing the fastest and the quickest and the first. Um, but uh, is there any sense that you have that they've learned as a country from what they did right and what they didn't do right 10 China years ago? China is the only country, if you look at the World Economic Outlook projection that were pulled out this today is the only country in the sense that it's projected to grow at almost 2% in 2020. Uh, and it's projected to grow more than 8% next year. So in some sense, China got hit first by the pandemic and it's the first one that's starting to come mm -hmm. out from the hole. Um, it's not just the, pol the policy response. So we have seen uh, the, uh, the PBOC, of course, providing support to the economy in terms of cutting rates, in terms of incentivize bank to continue to provide credit to, to, to corporation. Uh, it's the fiscal policy response, both at the central government as well as the local government. But it's not that, it's also the policy response in terms of controlling the pandemic, right? So they've been very successful to bring the pandemic under control. And I think that's a lesson that can be learned from them for other countries as well. That there is no way out of this until the pandemic is under control. And that means not only that, that we need to move away from the lockdown and reopening the economy, but there has to be trust in the system because what matters is social distancing. You can reopen anything you want. If people continue to practice social distancing, the economy is not going to restart. So that, to me, it's an important lesson uh, that we can take from China. Now, that said, there are still some financial vulnerabilities in China that we had highlighted in previous global financial stability report. Uh, some of them had to do, for example, with corporates. Some have to do with the wealth management industry, so this so-called shadow banking, which is, uh, I've seen some releveraging coming back in recent months. Also with local governments and they, how they are interconnected with corporates and banks. So there are pockets of vulnerabilities that we highlighted before. So it's important that the authorities there, as they continue as to come out of the of the crisis, they also continue to keep focus on, on addressing some financial vulnerabilities. So now, at, at the rate we're going, we're seeing debt rise exponentially all over the world, debt to GDP. Do you think there's a way out of this for countries without printing more money? So debt to GDP, it's a, it's a ratio, right? So um, yes. the numerator is going up quite a bit now because people, the countries are running large fiscal deficit. They're putting up more debt to address the pandemic. Of course, the best way to uh, help reduce the ratio, it's also increasing the denominator. So you need growth in some sense, right? So the best way to bring debts and that to make debt sustainable again is to have economy growing. Um, that, and also taking advantage of the fact that rates are much lower interest rates. So the interest rate payments will be lower. So the combination of that condition where rates are kept lower by central bank action plus possibly growth coming back, that should help bring uh, debt to GDP back to sustainable path for, 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 for many countries. And maybe investing more in things like a sustainable economy, like the green economy will help. One point that we're trying to push here is the importance of inv public investment, right? Public yeah. investment, yeah. the economy will, in some sense, whether we like it, not continue to change and restructure. We have right. seen some shift away. So I've been back to the office now. It's my second time since March, for example. Wow. <laughs> the way we work from home versus office, it, one could assume there could be change 
permanently, right? You're not gonna work five days in the office, you're gonna work just a number of days. It's gonna affect the value of commercial real estate, for example, in big cities, it's gonna affect uh, real estate more broadly, even like residential real estate. But it's also the way we work in terms of like digitalization, how much is done what we're doing now as opposed to <laughs> doing in person. And so what we have been pushing a lot for the public investment in areas such as digitalization, education, for example, to make sure that this, we address scarring, the people that lost their job, they don't mm -hmm. completely pay their human capital. And then one way to be smarter, more inclusive and greener. So you mentioned greener. I think this is a good opportunity to push toward uh, a less carbon intensive economy and greener economy. Great. Great. Now, do, do you worry, does IMF worry that this is going to make more individuals dependent upon uh, government furlough schemes or you know, just government payouts going forward at all? Or do you, do you think with these initiatives to, to push for these economic changes as the, the world economy develops, um, that we're that's going to take care of a lot of these problems through, through growth? It's done properly. And so if we prepare for the structural changes related to digitalization, to, for example, addressing climate, those sectors can create jobs. Uh, the important though is that this job creation needs to be inclusive. So there's not gonna be people left behind because their skills are obsolete, because scaring, they just, they, again, their, their human capital get depleted. Mm -hmm. That's for me, that's important investing in education, for example, to make sure that we bring with us as many people as possible so that they can be part of the story of success where the economy gets transformed because it, it's, that's the direction where it's headed now. Yep. The longer that we're in this low interest rate environment, Fabio, it's, it's going to be harder and harder for governments to um, raise the rates again and for central banks to raise the rates again. Um, how, how do you see the relationship between the length of time we're at these low rates uh, and that decision to finally pull the lever and start cranking interest rates back up? I, I think the, the right way to start this discussion is to look back again. I'm biased here, but uh, the Fed right? So the Fed managed to start normalizing. And so if you go back a few years ago, uh, starting in 2015 with Chair Yellen, we started raising interest rate. Uh, so gradually raised into the federal fund rate above 200 basis points, so 2%. We also start normalize the size of the balance sheet. Now, the question is, that what is the terminal point? Can you raise rates back to where they were pre-financial crisis 10 years ago? So the, the question becomes, what is the equilibrium real interest rate in some sense? And it's possible that interest rate has come down for a number of reasons, because productivity has declined, because of demographics, because of a number of factors. So you may probably not be able to go back to where we were 10 plus years ago. But to me, that experience shows that if it's done gradually, if it's done properly, it's well communicated in a context where there is economic growth, at some point rates will be able to come up again. So this, this is why it's so important to make sure that there are no scaring effects here, that they don't leave a negative mark of productivity so that because lower productivity will mean even lower interest rate. And if you get stuck in a very low interest rate environment, equilibrium low interest rate environment, means one, that every time that there is a recession, you don't have enough policy space, so you cannot cut as much, for example. So the, the average recession cut, I think was 400 basis points or so. So if you're close to, if you're closer to zero, you can't cut as much unless you wanna go very negative. Uh, also means the productivity is lower. So there's a number of reasons why you're more subset uh, to shock, you have less space to provide support. So it's important that at some point when the economy allows it, when the recovery is sustainable underway, the central bank communicate a clear exit plan and they start thinking exactly what the Fed did years ago, uh, which to me personally, I think was a success story. Yes, I would agree. Lastly, you know, uh, going into this uh, this annual meeting, there uh, started to be some talk about currency manipulation and and competitive devaluation. And I wonder, um, because we didn't have what we have, uh, we didn't ten years ago have what we have now, which is that 2013 uh, G20 commitment to avoid currency manipulation. Do you believe that can truly stop countries from engaging in that practice going forward? I mean, the, the main, uh, the advanced economies exchange rate are floating exchange rate, right? So there are, of course, implications from asset purchases and conventional monetary policy, um, because when you cut rates, when you engage in growth of asset purchase, those have implications not only for the equity market, as we discussed, not only for credit markets, but also for interest rate, for growth differential, and that's on exchange rate. But so far, we have seen exchange rate have been moving in, in the way markets wanted to move them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen also emerging markets when they engage in, uh, for example, asset purchases, they were not necessarily directed uh, to control exchange rate. So I, I think so far the policy response has been one which I would, I would judge as a success story here. 
uh, it's important to maintain cooperation in a number of aspects here. No? So trade is a good example. So avoid trade tensions. Um, uh, it's also important to make a trade system that is fair, that is rule-based within the WTOs to make sure that this geopolitical event of triggers that could adversely affect negative market uh, sentiment, that they're not there, that we actually prevent those triggers. But I, I think so far, uh, the discussion has been very much on like how effective policy has been. I think this is a success story up to now. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Fabio Natalucci there, the Deputy Director at the IMF uh, in charge of monetary and capital markets. Uh, our thanks to you. Scott, what we heard from him there uh, is really uh, that uh, he kind of took a victory lap with respect to how effective uh, central bank policy has been in terms of responding to this crisis. Yes, I, I thought really powerful commentary, really interesting. Um, you know, one of the comments I thought a question we asked was about whether or not central banks are running out of tools they can use, and uh, he, he pretty reassuredly told us no. <laughs> Which is, I know the media likes to talk about this because they think, hey, you know, it's going to grab headlines, it's clickbait, but you know, central banks have a lot more they can do. Um, so again, this, this speaks volumes of the economic support that's out there for this recovery to continue and keep going. All right. Scott Garlis, thanks so much for being alongside with me for this interview. And we'll be bringing you much more coverage throughout the week of the Road to Recovery here at Stansbury Research. Stay tuned to our Facebook page, our Twitter page, and our YouTube channel for more.